Hello everyone, welcome to the Dr. Hayes video lecture, snow day edition. Um, it is Monday evening and I am very, very lucky that I live with a sound engineer and in about 20 minutes he whipped up a sound studio and set it up on our dining room table. Um, just a few things for you. I'm going to finish the chapter 17 blood lecture today. There's, I don't know, maybe 20 slides left if that. I'm going to assign you some top hat homework questions over various things from chapter 17. And if you'll remember, my top hat questions come directly from old exams. So they are the exact format of question that you will see. You're welcome to use your notes in the book while you answer them. Talk to each other if you're around someone else. Those have to be completed by the beginning of class on Thursday. Those will count for points. We will review those questions together the next time we meet. If you have not used Top Hat before, I will put a link on Georgia View to um, a help video by Top Hat that just kind of shows you what you're looking for. It should be pretty straightforward for you to find those questions I've assigned. I'm not sure how many of those there will be yet, but I don't know, seven or eight of them. I will not re-lecture over this material. You will be responsible for it on the exam. I have no idea what we're going to do with our lab schedule yet. I haven't gotten that far ahead. I did go ahead and email you the handout for the blood lab. We're going to do that at some point. My guess is we're going to have some rescheduling or combo of labs, but I just wanted to give you that ahead of time so you could look over it. I am picking up in Chapter 17... Around slide 41, 42-ish, we had just finished talking about erythrocytes, and we wanted to talk about what happened after the 100 to 120 day period once an erythrocyte had started to lose its function. It either starts to lose flexibility, or the hemoglobin starts to break down and it needs to be degraded. And I showed you there's this really large image in your textbook that covers a couple of different things. One of those is the production of erythrocytes. And if you remember, that was stimulated by this hormone called EPO or erythropoietin. It's produced by your kidneys, a little bit by the liver. And it gets released anytime that we are hypoxic. When blood oxygen is low out of homeostasis, that hormone gets released and it tells our red blood cells, kick into gear, make some more erythrocytes, let's get this blood oxygen level up. And so in this first slide here, you see those steps. And once those erythrocytes make it into the bloodstream, they're going to last about 120 days until they get to this degraded or less flexible point. Now this next slide, you see what happens when the body is breaking down that red blood cell. And like I mentioned at the end of class last time, is our body is fairly good at recycling materials that it can potentially reuse for another function. So in the case of a red blood cell, the hemoglobin portion, which we know is pretty much all of the contents, can be broken down and several parts of it can be reused for another function. For example, the globin protein portion, a protein is just amino acids. That protein can be unfolded, the amino acids broken apart, and those released back into the bloodstream, and we can make a different protein out of it. It's just like Legos. You use your Legos to build a princess castle, you take them apart, and the next day you build a pirate ship. The heme group, which is a combination of iron as well as that heme pigment, that's also going to be broken apart, and we'll keep the iron. Remember, iron's a pretty precious commodity in the body. We can't make it. We have to get it from our food, but it is toxic if it's on its own. So remember, it's attached to those proteins, either ferritin or hemosiderin, and stored in the liver. If we need to transport that iron to reuse it later, that's when that protein transferrin would come in. Now the leftover part, this part of the heme group that cannot be reused, is known as bilirubin. It's a funny word, it sounds like a person's name. That gets picked up by the liver, and that is going to get secreted into the intestine. We'll learn later that the liver is responsible for making a substance called bile that gets used in our digestive system to help break down fat. That bile gets stored in the gallbladder, but it is made by the liver. And that bilirubin gets put into the bile, 
and then it makes its way to the intestines where the bacteria in our large intestines will actually start to metabolize it or convert it into something else. And what they convert it into is something called stercobilin. Stercobilin comes out when you defecate and it is what is responsible for making your poop brown. So your brown colored poop is a result of the destruction of your erythrocytes. So since we've already talked about erythrocytes, let's take a few minutes and talk about the other formed elements or living cell components in the blood. So the next category we're going to talk about are leukocytes. And this is the only cell or formed element in your blood that is a complete cell. And what that means is it has nucleus, has a DNA, has organelles. It has everything that a stereotypical cell has within it. Now, if you think about that, say you were going to do um, a DNA test and you needed to do a paternity test or something like that, and they were to use blood, the only part of the blood that they could actually get DNA from is the leukocytes, which is why in an ancestry DNA or 23andMe or even in a paternity test, they actually like to use a cheek swab or they have you spit in a cup to get some of those cheek cells because those cells inside your cheek all have DNA in them. Because white blood cells, they're, you don't have very many of them, less than 1% of your total blood volume. Now, if you are sick, we do know that number can go up if you have an infection. And they're also capable of this very interesting thing called diapedesis. And what that means is white blood cells are actually able to leave the bloodstream and move into your tissues. Capillaries actually have some openings in them, and white blood cells can actually squeeze their way in between those openings to get to an area where a bacteria or a virus may be. The body does not want to wait for a bacteria or virus to get into the bloodstream. It wants to head it off at the past. Now, we can lump our white blood cells into two categories, and those are based on some physical characteristics. We have our granulocytes. What we're going to see is they look very granular. And our agranulocytes, they do not look very granular. Now, you can see those listed here. So our granulocytes are neutrophils, eosinophils. It's kind of a funny word to look at and say. Basophils. And then our agranulocytes are lymphocytes and monocytes. And those percentages do you see there represent what percentage of white blood cells they are. So clearly neutrophils are the most abundant white blood cell we have. There's a handy little acronym you can use to remember the most to least abundant of the white blood cells. And that acronym is never let monkeys eat bananas. So neutrophils are our most abundant, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils. Now, the big difference between these different types of white blood cells is what they're going to do for a function. We know that white blood cells are all involved in our immune system. They're all going to help protect us from foreign invaders, but they all specialize in dealing with slightly different invaders. Some of them are found in different locations. So we're going to walk through these first group by group. Here's our granulocytes, so neutrophil, eosinophil, basophil, never eat bananas. And you can see looking at these pictures, they all kind of look grainy. I know that's a strange descriptor, but it almost looks like they have little grains of sand with them. The basophil especially looks super grainy. This is very, very obvious when you look at these cells under a microscope. That is part of what we will do in the blood lab whenever we get to have the blood lab, we'll actually look at these and you'll actually have to be able to identify them under a microscope. Um, you'll notice in these pictures, in general, white blood cells are way bigger than red blood cells. You can see in all three of these pictures that we have numerous erythrocytes surrounding these. Um, a granulocyte is going to have a lobed nuclei, and this is where elementary school does us wrong, is we're taught that every cell kind of looks the same, and that they all have this round nucleus in the middle, when that is definitely not the case. You can see the eosinophil there almost looks like um, a, a coconut bra or a bikini top, 
where the neutrophil kind of looks like an old school telephone there. That dark purple area is the nucleus. It's just not a perfectly round circle. All of these granulocytes are capable of doing something called phagocytosis or phagocytosis. They're capable of engulfing and destroying another cell. So that'll be a pretty important characteristic we come back to later. So one by one, our neutrophils are the most abundant. Like I mentioned, that's the never and never let monkeys eat bananas. And they specifically target bacteria. They like to kill by this process called respiratory burst, which is a fancy way of saying that they use oxygen to kill things. I know that sounds weird. We'll talk more about it in the immune system chapter. And the interesting thing is, is they are attracted to areas of infection. So if you cut your finger and bacteria are introduced, chemical signals will actually attract neutrophils there. And because they can do that diapodesis, they can leave the blood, they can come to that tissue and kill the bacteria there rather than it getting further into your body. Eosinophils are my favorite white blood cell, and I am perfectly aware that that is the nerdiest thing on the planet to say. Um, but they're pretty badass. So these are not very abundant. This is eat and never let monkeys eat bananas. And their specific target is parasitic worms. So you can see in this picture, there is a, a little worm here on this green picture. And surrounding it are these little round structures. And what those are, are the eosinophils that have surrounded that parasite. And they're releasing an enzyme that will basically dissolve that parasitic worm. Now, we have them at very low levels because most of us are not walking around with parasitic worms. And most of us will probably never experience a parasitic infection in our lifetime. However, individuals who lack access to clean water or clean food or health standards, which is true for many, many countries in the world, they may deal with parasitic infections and an elevated eosinophil level could be indicative of a parasitic infection, even if there are not some other obvious signs of that. Basophils, these are the super granular ones. They're pretty easy to identify, but they're very, very rare. So when you're looking at a microscope slide of blood, you may not have a single one of these on your whole slide because they're so rare. And those granules are very, very important. These don't really function the same way that most white blood cells do. They're not actually attacking anything, but they're sending out the signals that bring other cells like neutrophils to an area. So those granules contain a substance called histamine. You've probably heard of it. If you're like me and you have allergies, you take an antihistamine. Um, histamine is that chemical thing that attracts other white blood cells to an area of damage or infection. Now, the A granulocytes, you can see them here on the right of the slide. We have the lymphocyte and the monocyte. Um, they're pretty easy to identify. The lymphocyte has this gigantic round nucleus. The monocyte has this kind of kidney-shaped nucleus. They don't really look as grainy as the other cells. So if we look at lymphocytes here, it's pretty easy to identify. About a quarter of your white blood cells are there. Honestly, when you're looking at a microscope slide, this is usually the first one you're able to solidly identify. Um, the nucleus takes up almost all of the cell volume. You can see that dark purple there is the nucleus, and that lighter purple is the rest of the cell. We do have these in our blood, but we also have these cells in other places. You have other tissues like your tonsils or your appendix, where these cells like to hang out rather than circulating around. We have two different kinds of lymphocytes. T lymphocytes, they like to target viruses and tumors, so your own cells that have gone rogue. And then we have B lymphocytes, and these are um, cells that produce antibodies in response to infection. Antibodies don't actually destroy anything, but they can mark something for destruction. We're going to talk a lot, a lot about lymphocytes when we get to chapter 21, the immune system chapter. Now, monocytes are also pretty easy to identify. They have that really big 
kind of kidney shaped nucleus. But the way that this is different than our granulocytes is you can see that that nucleus is really connected. While it's curved, it's not two separate lobes. When you see them side by side, it's pretty easy to tell the difference. Um, these are very big, physically the largest. While not the most abundant, physically the largest. And these definitely are capable of leaving the blood and entering tissues when that chemical signal is released. Now what's interesting about a monocyte is I liken it a bit to Clark Kent and Superman. So Clark Kent is this mild-mannered Daily Planet reporter who goes about his day in his glasses and his briefcase. But then when he's called or summoned, he goes in the phone booth and he puts his underwear on the outside of his clothes, loses the glasses, and lo and behold, he's Superman. So a monocyte is kind of like that. When a monocyte is circulating, circulating around in the blood, it's a monocyte. When it leaves the blood and goes into a tissue, we refer to it as a macrophage. Now, this protects against all kinds of things, viruses, parasites, chronic infections. Monocytes are kind of a general purpose defender. Now, this looks a little bit more complicated than it looked when we were talking about the formation of erythrocytes. I don't want you to freak out about this one. You do not have to know the name of every in-between step here the way I want you to know the in-between steps of erythrocytes, but I am going to point some things out to you. The first thing I want you to notice at the very top of this flow chart, every white blood cell, no matter which of the five kinds it is, starts out as a hematopoietic stem cell. That is the same type of cell that an erythrocyte started out as. It is the same type of cell that a platelet will start out as. So every cell in the blood, no matter what kind, is going to start as a hematopoietic stem cell. Now you'll notice we see a branch in this flow chart where some of them become this myeloid stem cell and some of them become this lymphoid stem cell. So what I want you to gain from this is notice that lymphocytes, B and T lymphocytes, have their kind of own developmental pathway. They're over on the right of that flow chart. Everything else, eosinophils, basophils, neutrophils, monocytes, all have a really similar developmental pathway. But the key to remember, every blood cell starts out as a hematopoietic stem cell, and once it becomes a committed cell, it cannot change its mind. So if something becomes a myeloblast, it's going to become an eosinophil, a basophil, a neutrophil, or a monocyte. If something becomes a B lymphocyte precursor committed cell, it has to become a B lymphocyte. Right? Once you're to that committed stage. Now notice this pathway looks very different than the erythrocyte pathway did. The nucleus never gets ejected. The organelles never get ejected. Um, so it's not mitosis. This isn't cell division because we're originating as a stem cell, but it's still a really different pathway than how an erythrocyte is formed. Now the last formed element we need to talk about are platelets. Platelets are odd in that they are actually pieces of cells. So a platelet is considered a cytoplasmic fragment. Um, of a really big cell called a megakaryocyte. So megakaryocytes will break into these really, really tiny pieces, and we refer to those pieces as platelets. On this picture here, you see the platelets kind of clustered up um, in the top left-hand corner of the picture. That's actually a big clump of platelets. They're very small, way smaller than erythrocyte. And the reason they're so small is it works really well for blood clotting. If you think about it, you know, we use small sandbags if we're trying to stop flooding rather than giant sandbags. So the same premise for a platelet. And they do not last long at all. They only make it about 10 days. And that's partly because they are just these tiny cell fragments. Now, these are controlled by a separate hormone called thrombopoietin. We're not going to get into all the details of its function, but it operates on negative feedback. If you need more platelets, thrombopoietin is released it triggers the production of more platelets. Now you'll notice we did not talk about a hormone relative to white blood cells because what triggers white blood cell formation is going to be infection. If you're infected with a bacteria or a virus, that can trigger the production of more white blood cells, not a hormone. So here is the pathway 
that it takes to make a platelet. And you'll notice, hey, guess what? It starts with a hematopoietic stem cell. And what happens is we form this really giant cell called a megakaryocyte. And notice I have a note on this slide. It says the megakaryoblast, that first step past the stem cell, undergoes a lot of mitosis, but no cytokinesis. So what that means is the cell is making copies of itself, but it's not breaking apart. So you'll notice in that next stage, we have this really big multinucleate cell. It almost looks like that cell is polka dot. All of those are tiny little nuclei in there. So eventually we get this really big megakaryocyte that ruptures into these teensy tiny fragments that we know as platelets. Now, we said that platelets are really important for stopping blood flow, for blood clotting. And so we refer to this process as hemostasis blood halting or, or stopping the blood flow. And it's really, really fast, obviously, because you don't want to bleed to death. And it's very localized. So obviously, if damage has occurred to a blood vessel in your finger, the response is going to be local to where the damage is. And this is one of very, very few examples in the body of positive feedback. So we talked about negative feedback. With oh, sorry. Sorry. Siri just started talking. Um, we've talked about negative feedback, but now we're going to talk about positive feedback. So I like to use the term runaway train with this rather than a response occurring and then it's stopping like it does in negative feedback. Here the response is going to get larger and larger and larger until we're back in homeostasis. So notice in this diagram or this figure here on this slide, we have had damage to this blood vessel. And the very first thing that's going to happen is vasoconstriction. Now we mentioned this, that blood vessels can either constrict to reduce the amount of blood flow, which is what happens when we're cold as well, or they can dilate to increase blood flow. So the first step when you have damage to a blood vessel is that blood vessel is going to constrict to try and reduce the blood flow. Very, very quickly thereafter, platelets are going to start to stick to that area. Any, a damaged blood vessel is kind of sticky, and the platelets stick there. Now, what's interesting is when one platelet sticks, it produces these chemicals that make it sticky, and more platelets stick, and more platelets stick. I used to play this game when I was a kid called sardines. It was like reverse hide-and-go-seek. Instead of one person hiding and it, everybody searching for him and going, I found him, I found him. One person would hide, and then if you found them, you would hide with them. And so you're all crammed into this tiny place, why it was called sardines. I feel like platelets are a lot like that. One platelet sticks, and another platelet comes by and sticks, and another platelet comes by and sticks, and on and on and on. Now, eventually, fibrin will form this mesh that lays over the top of the platelets in order to form the clot in that area. Now, obviously, if you don't have enough platelets or your platelets are not functioning correctly, this could present a pretty big problem because you would be continuing to bleed out of that wounded area. Now, I mentioned in class that blood clotting is a really, really complicated process, and uh, you don't have to know all the steps in this diagram. I put it up there to kind of illustrate how complicated it is. And it, it's one of those situations where... A has to happen for B to happen, for C to happen, for D to happen. And if you disrupt any step in that pathway, the entire pathway can fail. And one of the things that is absolutely critical for blood to clot correctly are these substances called clotting factors. Most of them are proteins, and they're made in our liver. You notice a theme there. We said that some of the other proteins in our plasma are made in our liver. Clotting factors are also made in our liver. And we need all of those clotting factors for the blood clotting process to work perfectly. So someone who has hemophilia may be lacking one of those blood clotting factors. They could be lacking something else. And so getting a blood transfusion may be helpful to them. The really tricky part with clotting factors is that vitamin K is required for the human body to make three of the clotting factors. If you don't have vitamin K, you can't make the clotting factor. 
Well, where this becomes problematic is a lot of babies are born vitamin K deficient. Um, Usually their body catches up within a couple of days, but the problem can become if you're vitamin K deficient and you have just been born either vaginally or through a C-section, which is a pretty traumatic process to the body, there's the potential that you could have internal hemorrhaging. So it is not uncommon for healthcare providers to give a newborn infant a vitamin K injection. Well, unfortunately, as with, well, fortunately, right, parental permission is required to do that. Unfortunately, because the anti-vaccine movement has become so common, a lot of parents have mistakenly thought this vitamin K injection was a vaccination, when in fact it's just a vitamin supplement in injection form, right? It's like taking your multivitamin or your Flintstones or whatever it is you take, um, or a B12 shot. And so parents are declining this vitamin K injection. There have been cases of infants dying of internal hemorrhage because they were vitamin K deficient, they couldn't make the clotting factor, and they experienced a bruise or a bump during childbirth. Again, it happens. It's a pretty traumatic event. Um, And those babies bleed to death. So this is a case where scientific misinformation um, about vaccines and what a vaccine is and what a vaccine isn't and what can happen with vaccines, even though this isn't a vaccine, where scientific misinformation has actually led to death. So I mentioned before that as a healthcare provider, a big job you will have will often be correcting misinformation and misconceptions. And this is a case where, you know... Maybe we need to talk about this before you're in the hospital giving birth, or maybe we need to do a better way of presenting information to new parents on why this is necessary for them. But vitamin K, who who would have thought it played such a critical role in keeping us healthy? So that is the end of chapter 17, the blood chapter. Um, I would encourage you to read the textbook. It's very handy. Now, of course, there is material in the textbook that I did not cover, I try and be conscientious of how much time we have to cover all the chapters that are required. I do some stuff in lab. For example, blood typing is in your textbook. We'll talk about that in lab one of these days. Um, There's lots of diseases talked about in the book that we'll um, hit some of in lab. But read the textbook. Use your notes. Answer the top hat questions. We will review the top hat questions at the beginning of the next class that we have. If for some godforsaken reason we are buried under piles of snow and don't have class Thursday, tune back in. I'm going to leave this set up on my dining room table in case I need it. And I'll jump into chapter 18 for you. Hopefully I will see you in class on Thursday and we will get back to our regular schedule soon. Enjoy your snow day.